And please join me in standing. Praise the Lord, sing to the Lord a new song, his praise in the assembly of the godly. Let us worship God. Let us pray. Almighty God, you have commanded us to worship, to praise you in the assembly of the godly, and so we have come this morning at your command uh, to give you worship and praise and thanksgiving. You have adorned us with salvation. You've made our hearts glad. You've reconciled us to yourself through the perfect obedience and substitutionary death of our Savior Jesus Christ. You have granted us the gift of the Holy Spirit uh, so that we might, as saved men and women, give you the worship that rightly belongs to you, our Maker and our Redeemer. So today, today as we worship, we pray that you would remove from us all the cares of this world, distracting thoughts, those things that would keep us apart from focusing on you, your glory, the word that you speak, and the will that you reveal for our lives. We come to you on this, the Lord's day, that we might praise you and to help us in our praise so that we will not forget you you have given us the Sabbath day and commanded us to keep it holy. We would ask that you would forgive us. Oftentimes we've not delighted in the Sabbath, but looked upon it as a burden, an infringement on our pleasure. And for that, we abhor ourselves and come before you in brokenness and in confession. Often we have insisted on using the day as we would like to use it, instead of submitting ourselves to use the day the way you have commanded us to, for our good, for our joy, uh, both in this life and, and in the life to come. So we would pray our Heavenly Father that you would forgive us of those times when we've sinned against you by carelessness with your Sabbath day. 
Cause us to know that as we confess our sins, you are faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Impress upon us that when we sin, we have an advocate even with you, even Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. So we pray now that as we've confessed our sins, trusting in your pardoning mercy, that you'll cause us to hear your words of pardon, that we might know our sins are forgiven. And as a forgiven people, our hearts full of joy, may we give to you that worship that is pleasing to you. We pray that you'll work mightily in our lives this day, even as we pray that prayer that our Savior taught us to pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. People of God, what do you believe? I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Ghost, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sitteth on the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Ghost, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. And you may be seated. If you'll open your Bibles, please, to Genesis, the 27th chapter, I'll begin reading at verse 41. Uh, we are in that part of Genesis uh, where Isaac has blessed his son Jacob with the blessing of the covenant. It is through Jacob that the line of the Messiah will continue and eventually come to the birth of our Savior, Jesus Christ. Uh, we have seen how to obtain that blessing that God had promised, but Jacob and Rebekah were not willing to wait for God to fulfill his promise, but took it into their own hands, uh, that Jacob and Rebekah deceived Isaac. And what a sorry story this is. A family torn apart, some with a mixture of faith and unbelief, and in the case of Esau, pure unbelief. But we see God is sovereign over sin. Uh, sin does not thwart his fulfilling his purpose. So he is working through Rebekah and Jacob's deceiving. He is sovereign over sin, over Isaac's spiritual lethargy. He is sovereign over sin, even sovereign over Esau's hatred of the things of God. And Jacob, as we'll find out in this passage, he is going to be disciplined because the son that God loves, he disciplines. And over many, many years, he'll be chastened. He'll become a man of integrity. This is God at work, triumphing over the sins of his people, fulfilling all the good purposes that he has for them. Let us hear God's word. Beginning at verse 41. Now Esau hated Jacob because of the blessing with which his father had blessed him. And Esau said to himself, the days of mourning for my father are approaching then I will kill my brother Jacob. But the words of Esau, her older son, were told to Rebekah. So she sent and called Jacob, her younger son, and said to him, Behold, your brother Esau comforts himself about you by planning to kill you. 
Now therefore, my son, obey my voice. Arise, flee to Laban, my brother in Haran, and stay with him a while until your brother's fury turns away, until your brother's anger turns away from you, and he forgets what you have done to him. Then I will send and bring you from there. Why should I be bereft of you both in one day? Then Rebekah said to Isaac, I loathe my life because of the Hittite women. If Jacob marries one of the Hittite women, like these, one of the women of the land, what good will my life be to me? Then Isaac called Jacob and blessed him and directed him, You must not take a wife from the Canaanite women. Arise, go to Padan Aram, to the house of Bethuel, your mother's father, and take as your wife from there one of the daughters of Laban, your mother's brother. God Almighty bless you and make you fruitful and multiply you, that you may become a company of peoples. May he give the blessings of Abraham to you and to your offspring with you, that you may take possession of the land of your sojournings that God gave to Abraham. Then Isaac sent Jacob away, and he went to Paddan Aram, to Laban, the son of Bethuel, the Aramean, the brother of Rebekah, Jacob, and Esau's mother. Now Esau saw that Isaac had blessed Jacob and sent him away to Paddan Aram to take a wife from there and that as he blessed him, he directed him, you must not take a wife from the Canaanite women. And that Jacob had obeyed his father and his mother and gone to Paddan Aram. And when Esau saw that the Canaanite women did not please Isaac, his father, Esau went to Ishmael and took as his wife, besides the wives he had, Mahalath, the daughter of Ishmael, Abraham's son, the sister of Nebaioth. And here ends the Old Testament lesson, and this is the word of the Lord. Let us bow now in prayer. Almighty God, our Heavenly Father, our prayer-hearing King, You have commanded us to pray without ceasing, to ask, to seek, and to knock, to come into your presence boldly, promptly, regularly, asking for those things that are agreeable to your will, to bring you glory, to build us up in holiness, to increase the blessings that you pour out upon your church as you respond to their prayers. You've called us to prayer time and time again. And I would ask that you would make us to be a people of prayer. Come among us, come among us now. Stir up within us the desire to pray for our church, to pray for our church privately, in our families, and publicly in the meetings of the church. May we delight in coming before you. May there not be any gaps in our life in which we're failing to come before you, our prayer hearing God. We would pray for the holiness of our church. Grant us deeper purity of life. We would pray for the boldness of our church, that we would be faithful to our calling to be salt and light in a fallen world. We would pray for perseverance, that our desire to walk in communion with our Savior Jesus Christ and in obedience to his word would not be just for a season, but throughout our entire lives and throughout the life of this church. We would pray for our church that our lives might be marked by deep repentance, mourning over sin, turning from it, and pursuing righteousness. Teach us to pray, our Heavenly Father. 
Teach us to pray in the way that you have commanded. We come praying for our nation. We would ask relief from the pandemic, that you would turn it away from us, but we would pray that as you have left us in the midst of it, that we might hear your word. You're summoning us to repentance. You're calling upon us to take our eyes off those things that are fleeting and passing away and to focus them on things eternal. You're calling us to recognize that this pandemic is a warning. There will come a time when we will all stand before your judgment throne. And may we heed the warning that comes to us now from your good hand that we might be ready to stand before you in the day of judgment, not trusting in ourselves and our own righteousness, but in Jesus' blood and righteousness. We pray for our leaders. We would pray that during this election year, you would raise up leaders of integrity, men and women whose lives are marked by a sense that they know that they're servants of the people, and most of all, your servants. Give us leaders like that and cause us to see when we don't have them that it's your chastisement upon us that we don't live as we should or pray as we should. We ask that you would grant to us leaders of integrity. Make us people that pray from hearts that are distinguished by Christian integrity. We pray for those that are suffering in our congregation and in our extended church family. We pray for Faye Albritton and Marsha Williams. We pray that you'll sustain them in their affliction, cause them to know the joy of salvation, the knowledge that they're loved by your people. We pray for our sister Mary Cato, who fell earlier this morning. We uh, pray that you'll grant healing to her body that as Bob and their family care for them, that they might be an encouragement to her, and that the doctors, as they see her, that they might minister to her comfort and healing. We pray for the parents of our congregation. May they discharge their duty faithfully to raise their children in the nurture and the admonition of the Lord. In our desire to give our children things good things. We pray that we won't neglect to give them what is best of all, a home where Christ is at the center, where the word reigns supreme, where the worship of you, our God and King, is central to the life of the home and in the church where they bring their children to worship. We pray for children, that you'll give them hearts that are, first of all, obedient to their parents and through their parents, obedient to you. May they honor their father and mother. And in learning to honor them, may they honor you, our God and King. We pray for the people that our church supports in its work. For Harris and Laura, bond, Laura Beth Bond, we pray for them as they plant a church in very trying circumstances in Monroe, Louisiana raise up support from that church, for that church, raise up those that would come alongside them to worship and to do the work of the church, grant them joy in their work. We pray for Consulting Services Foundation and for Bob Bailey and Bebo Elkin and Wayne Herring as they tried to bring together pulpit committees and candidates for the pastorate we pray that you'll put within our churches men of strong character, of gospel conviction, with skills to lead, and enable this group uh, to identify those men and introduce them to churches that need pastors. We pray for Covenant Christian School, Manchester Academy, Thomas Christian Academy, our public schools in Yazoo City and Yazoo County, so many decisions must be made and made quickly. We pray that all that lead 
might have the wisdom they need to guide the children and the parents they love through this difficult time as they seek to build their churches up in the work, that, or their schools up in the work that you've called them to do. We pray for wisdom for these leaders and for the teachers that stand with them. And we pray for Calvary Baptist Church here in Yazoo City, our brothers and sisters serving you there. We pray for Ron Ball as he's accepted the call to be the next pastor of that congregation. Give him joy in his work. May that church grow under his ministry of the word. May it increase in godliness. We pray that Pastor Ball and his, his family might delight themselves in the work that you've called him to do. Now we would pray as we think about the tithes that we will bring, the offerings that we give. We pray that we'll give cheerfully. We pray as we plan out our giving that we'll be thinking intentionally about you, your work, the support that you've commanded us to bring for these works. We pray that you'll make us cheerful and obedient give, givers. And this we pray in the name of Jesus Christ, the Savior who loved us and gave himself for us. Amen. As our offertory is played this morning, we pray that you'll think about, first of all, offering your hearts to God and then think about the tithes and offerings that you'll bring to the Lord in this place of worship or as you bring them or mail them uh, to the church office during this time of pandemic. Uh, let's think deeply on these things during the offertory. Well, this morning I would ask that you open your Bibles to John, the fourth chapter, as we continue our studies in John's Gospel, and I'll be reading to you verses 31 through 38. Uh, we've been in this passage now for several weeks. Uh, we remember that Jesus and his disciples arrived in Samaria, that the disciples had left Jesus alone at a well while they went into town to purchase food, to bring back to our Savior who was hungry and weary, and also thirsty. And it was his thirst that occasioned 
uh, his conversation with a woman who came alone to the well, and as we've discovered, uh, she came alone to that well, uh, not with a group of women, because she was a morally disreputable woman. Uh, she had lived and continued to live in immorality. And it was in a conversation with that woman that her eyes were opened and she came to see that Jesus was the Christ. And we discovered last week that she rushed back to her town and told them about Jesus, the man that knew her heart, that knew everything about her life and invited them to come see him. Can this be the Christ? And many of them come to believe that he's savior of the world. Now in that time after the woman left to go back to her home, after a conversation with Jesus, but before the crowds return, that's where we pick up now. Jesus' conversation with his disciples while they're alone together. Before I read you God's word, let's go to him in prayer. Almighty God, our heavenly King, you speak to us through your royal word. Man does not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds from your mouth. And we would live our heavenly Father before you. So give us ears to hear what you teach us this morning, and this we pray in Christ's name, amen. And hear God's word. Meanwhile, the dis disciples were urging him, saying, Rabbi, eat. But he said to them, I have food to eat that you do not know about. So the disciples said to one another, has anyone brought him something to eat? Jesus said to them, my food is to do the will of him who sent me and to accomplish his work. Do you not say, there are yet four months, then comes harvest? Look, I tell you, lift up your eyes and see that the fields are white for harvest. Already the one who reaps is receiving wages and gathering fruit for eternal life, so that the sower and reaper may rejoice together. For here the saying holds true, one sows and another reaps. I sent you to reap that for which you did not labor. Others have labored and you have entered in to their labor. And here ends the scripture lesson. And this is the word of the Lord. When I think of someone who wanted to live a life that counts, I think of Mary Jones. In 1800, 15 year old Mary made an extraordinary journey. She was the poor daughter of a Welsh weaver. She set out, determined of all things, to own her very own Bible. And you'll sympathize with Mary. After all, she had to walk two miles to the nearest home where there was a copy of God's word. And she did that regularly. And for six years, she saved her money, every bit that she earned, so that she would have enough money to buy her own Bible. Which one of us, when we were a child, ever saved our money so that we could own our very own Bible? But that's what Mary did for six years. And now she had the money in hand and she walked barefoot 26 miles to the place where Bibles were sold, only to be told, told that all the Bibles had already been sold. Well, this story has a happy ending. Thomas Charles, the Bible seller, was also a minister, and he just didn't have the heart to tell Mary that there was no Bible there for her. So he sold her a copy that he had set aside for another person. 
And then he went and founded the British and Foreign Bible Society so that anyone who wanted a copy of God's word could have it. But back to Mary, six years saving, 26 miles walking, all so that she could reveal, read God's revealed will. She wanted to live a life that counts. And I know that that's what each one of you want. You want to live a life that counts. I want you to live that life. And there are three musts for that to happen. First, you must eat the food that matters. You must eat the food that matters. The disciples returned from their shopping. Look at verse 31. Meanwhile, the disciples were urging Jesus, saying, Rabbi, teacher, eat. Uh, they're, they're urging him to stop what he's been doing and eat. And they're right to do that. Our Savior, the God-man, he was fully human and fully divine. But as the God-man here among us, uh, he would grow hungry, he would grow thirsty, and he would grow weary, just like you and I do. That means something to us, doesn't it? That means that right now our Savior exalted at the right hand of the Father. Uh, he prays to you as a, for you as a sympathetic high priest who's gone through these experiences just like you, but without sin. But anyway, these disciples, they're exactly right. He needs food, he needs drink, he needs rest, does our Savior. But there are higher priorities than these. There are things more important than food and drink and, and rest. And Jesus is going to talk to these men about these higher priorities now. Look at verse 32. Jesus said to them, I have food to eat that you do not know about. Uh, here's what you call a teaching moment. While they're thinking about food, physical food, while that's on their mind, Jesus is gonna take this moment and turn it into an opportunity to talk to them about spiritual food, the spiritual food they must have if they're going to live a life that counts. But the disciples, they don't get it yet. Look at verse 33. The disciples said to one another, has anyone brought him something to eat? They're only thinking about physical food. While we were gone, did someone else come giving food so that he's now no longer uh, hungry? They don't even think to ask Jesus to clarify what he meant. Well, Jesus does clarify. Look at verse 34. Jesus said to them, my food, that's the food we're concentrating on now, the food that Jesus has. My food is to do the will of him who sent me and to accomplish his work. My food is to do the will of him who sent me. Who sent him? His heavenly Father. My food is to do the will of him who sent me and to accomplish his work. Well, what was the work that the Father sent him to do? Well, just think about everything that Jesus did. His teaching, his miracles, his compassion upon people. Those are things that the Father sent him to do. He also sent him to meet with Nicodemus and to plead for his soul. And he sent him to this woman at the well in Samaria that, so that she might come to know the Savior of the world. Jesus was always doing the will of his Father. That was his food to accomplish the Father's work. And he accomplished that work upon the cross. When there from the cross he proclaimed, it is finished. 
that work that the Father had given him to do to bear the sins of his people, that work was now done and completed. It's a finished work that Christ was sent to do and that he accomplished. Jesus would pray in that great prayer of John 17. He would pray to his Father. On the night of his betrayal, I glorified you on earth, having accomplished the work that you gave me to do. My, thought, my food is to do the will of him who sent me. And the Father has sent you. He sent you. He sent you to the place that you live. He sent you to the, into the family in which you live. He sent you to this church. He sent you to the place that you work. And your food must be to do the will of the Father that sent you there. He has sent you. And knowing that, that should energize you. Doing his will should give you satisfaction. It should bring you joy. Don't be disoriented, walking around in life as if you have no purpose. Your Father has sent you to where you are. And it should make all the difference in the world. I remember that place in John's Gospel where he talks about the other John, John the Baptist. There was a man sent from God whose name was John. John was sent. And I believe, had he not known that, had he, had, had he not known that from before the foundations of the earth, God had designed him to send him into the wilderness with all of its hardships, he would have crumbled there. I believe that John would have lost his nerve when he went to confront Herod and Herodias about their adultery. A man and a woman who, from a human standpoint, held his life in his hands, in, in their hands. Had he not known that he had been sent by God to rebuke them for their immorality, I don't believe he would have ever gone. He would have lost his nerve. But he knew that God, who makes no mistakes, had sent him there. And then, when he was in prison, awaiting his execution, his beheading, he there would have fallen into despair if he did not know with a certainty that God had sent him. And I want you to have that assurance. You, believer, have been sent to where you are right now by the Father who loves you. And he's given you food so that you'll have the strength to accomplish his work. My food is to do the will of him who sent me. Your food is to do the will of God who sent you. And I want you to live a life that counts. I want you to eat the food that matters. You must if you're going to live a life that counts. And that's what we're talking about this morning, a life that counts. I want that for you. I know you want that for yourself. And if you're going to live a life that counts, you must first eat the food that matters. And next, you must do the work that matters. Look with me at verse 35. Jesus says, Do you not say, there are yet four months, then comes the harvest? So I assume that at this time, these men who had to work to support themselves. I assume that um, they would say to themselves, well, there's another four months, then the harvest is gonna come. 
The harvesters are going to go into the field. They're going to gather in the grain. They're going to do that and then they're going to be paid. A physical harvest. They're thinking about a harvest that's going to come later in the year. Well, Jesus interjects a note of urgency. Look again at verse 35. Do you not say there are yet four months, then comes the harvest? Look, I tell you, lift up your eyes and see that the fields are white for harvest. Look up now, raise up your eyes, and you'll see right before you a spiritual harvest a harvest of souls that you must enter uh, into. Now, what did he tell them to look up and to see? Well, I believe that it was the men and women who had heard the testimony of the Samaritan woman, the woman who said, could this be the Christ? And they came out to see. Well, it was these human beings that were coming to Jesus to see him. And they were dressed in white. The dyeing of fabrics was a luxury that they could not have afforded. And so they're coming to see if this is the Christ. And they'll come to profess that he's the savior of the world. Look up. Here comes the harvest. These men and women, uh, they're coming to meet me. And over the next few days, we're going to enter into a great harvesting of their souls to eternal life. Now, if you want to live a life that counts, then you need to do the work that matters. And that means being a part of the great harvest of men and women as they come to believe in Christ as Savior. Now, there's an urgency to harvesting. The farmer, he knows that he must reap at harvest time or his crop is lost. All of his labor is in vain if he does not harvest. And Jesus interjects that urgency into the harvest of these men and women. Harvest them, bring them to the place where their faith is resting in me as the savior of the world or they're lost. And we need to have that sense of urgency. Do we have it? Uh, I, I think that the church, because of the condition of our country, its lack of spirituality, its rejection of moral and spiritual absolutes, we're forgetting that the work we do is a matter of spiritual life and death where the word is sown, souls must be harvested or they're lost and they're lost forever. Do the work that matters. You must if you want to live a life that counts. And that's what I want for you. I want you to live a life that counts. I know that's what you want, to live a life that counts and for that to happen you have to eat the food that matters. You have to do the work that matters. And thirdly, and finally, you must remember the proverb that matters. Look at verse 36. Already the one who reaps is receiving wages. That means the reward of his labor. Already the one who reaps is receiving wages and gathering fruit for eternal life. That fruit is the souls of men and women who will live before God forever. So what must they do? Or excuse me, let's back up and read again verse 36. Already the one who reaps is, re is receiving wages and gathering the fruit for eternal life so that sower and reaper may rejoice together. Christ has sown the word in that Samaritan woman she has believed. Now she goes back and tells them about Christ in her town. She's sowing the word in their hearts 
And now they're coming out to see if this is the savior of the world. Some, and Jesus says, for hear the saying, in other words, the proverb, look verse 37, for hear the saying, the proverb holds true. One sows and another reaps. That's the proverb. One sows and another reaps. Jesus has sown sown the gospel in the heart of that woman. However much she could understand about Jesus, she's sown that into the hearts of her fellow citizens. And now there's going to be the reaping of a harvest as those men and women come to faith in Jesus Christ. Jesus continues, verse 38, I sent you to reap that for which you did not labor. Others have labored. He's talking about himself and that Samaritan woman. And you have entered into their labor as these men and women come around Jesus and his disciples. Now they're going to work to bring about a harvest of souls during that brief time, that few days that they'll be with them. And here's one of those wonderful times in which both the sower and the reaper will do their work together. But here's what we need to remember. Some sow and some reap. Some of you will sow and watch the, and then watch the harvest as others enter into the labor and reap what you have sown. I think about parents, how prayerfully, arduously, year after year, they sow the word in the lives of their children. Sometimes they see an immediate harvest as that child comes to faith in Christ. At other times, they leave home unbelievers. But that word that was planted there hasn't been taken from them. It's still there and something happens that causes that seed to grow by the amazing grace of God and another harvests that soul for salvation as that young man or young woman comes to faith in Jesus Christ. Think of others who sowed the word faithfully in their children and they die without ever seeing that soul harvested. But here's what you need to know. We must sow, sow the word, sow it far and wide, sow the word. Sometimes you'll be there to be a part of the harvest. At other times, others will enter into the labor and make that harvest. But in that great day in heaven, both the ones who have sown and the ones who have harvested will rejoice together as about the throne is a multitude of too many to be numbered who have come to faith in our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. So, so, some of you will sow the word, others of you will harvest the fruit, some of you will do both. Uh, some of you will sow the word in the lives of people and you'll never see the fruit that comes. But as long as you live, you keep on praying, praying for the harvest. Philip Riken recalls Luke Short. I began our sermon with young Mary Jones, 16 year old, marching off to get her own personal copy of God's word. Let me end the sermon by talking with you about Luke Short. And we're gonna catch up with him at age 103. Luke Short was a colonial farmer in America. And as he sat at age 103 under a hedge on his Virginia plantation, he remembered a sermon that he heard preached 85 years earlier when he lived in England. The sermon was preached by the Puritan John Flavel. 
And as he thought upon that sermon and what it meant, he was converted. The word sown nine decades earlier, that word was sown and then nine day, decades earlier, the harvest came. And here's what's written on his tombstone. Here lies a babe in grace, aged three, who di died according to nature, aged 106. The testimony of Luke Short. Now, you want to live a life that counts. I know you do. So I've called upon you this morning to eat the food that matters, to do the work that matters, to remember the proverb that matters. So submit to God, you that want to live a life that counts. Sow the word, that's your duty. Trust God for the harvest. And when he grants a harvest, enter into that harvest as you claim men and women, boys and girls, for the Savior, Jesus Christ. We're a team, so let's all work together. Let's sow the word, and let's be reapers of the harvest, that both sower and reaper may rejoice together. Let us bow for prayer. Almighty God, our Heavenly Father, it is our desire to sow the word everywhere that we can. And then we pray that you, the Lord of the harvest, will cause the sown word to grow, to flourish, and to be harvested so that men and women, boys and girls, might be brought in safely to the kingdom of God. We want that, our Heavenly Father. We pray that. We pray that for your glory, for our good, and for the welfare of your church. In a moment, we're going to ask you to have pity upon the nations. We ask that as the word is sown, not only in this congregation, but by your people throughout the world, that men and women will hear and believe that there'll be a revival in our nation and throughout the world, and a great harvest of souls, and that we will be able to be alive in that day and rejoice as we see your churches full. That's our desire, and we present it to you in the name of Christ our Savior. Amen. Please stand as we sing our final hymn.
And now may the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Take and seal it.